And now I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Dr. Brian Russell. He is a uh, neurosurgeon here with us at Archville Neurosurgery Services. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology from Southern Illinois University and a Doctorate of Medicine degree from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. And he completed his neurosurgery residency at the University of Kansas. Please help me welcome Dr. Brian Russell. Thank you. As, as she said, um, I'm Brian Russell. My uh, wife and I are Northerners who have been down here about a year and a half. Uh, she was getting tired of the cold weather, and uh, I love to hunt and fish when I'm not here at Archbold, and so this seemed like a great fit for us. And I, and I always laugh when I uh, see the psychology degree, actually. When I started college, my goal was to be a baseball player. And uh, so I started as a PE major at Southern Illinois University. Uh, the Cardinals uh, traded and picked up a guy by the name of Ozzie Smith. And so I thought my career with the Cardinals was going to be very short lived. So we had to find something different to do. And so I switched to uh, psychology. And it was there in psychology that I got a good understanding of the brain, the nervous system, the spinal cord, prompting my application to medical school and eventually uh, getting into a neurosurgery residency program. And <clears throat> I've got to admit, I, I, don't, I don't want this to seem like a lecture. I honestly hate lectures. Uh, I had a bad reputation in medical school. I had a handful of neurosurgeons who would always call me or tell me when they've got an interesting case coming up. And so I would skip out on the lectures to go scrub in with them and help them in the neurosurgery cases. So I'm much more adapt to trying to fix things as opposed to giving a big lectures. So at any time during this talk, if you've got questions, raise your hands. I want to make this just as casual as we possibly can. So. Um, Back pain, as, as you're going to see, is something that really affects almost all of us. Somebody in your family, if not you, uh, back pain is a, a very common entity that, that we all seem to have to deal with at some time or another. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the causes of back pain. I'll talk a little bit about the, some of the symptoms of back pain, the way we diagnose it, and then I'll talk about some treatment options. And then toward the end, I'll show some of the uh, things that we do here at Archbold to try to uh, treat some of the patients when they have to come to surgery. So just a, a few statistics on back pain. It's uh, one of the leading causes of disability worldwide uh, in Europe. Uh, United States, it's the number one cause for people missing work. It's the second leading cause for people going to the doctor. The first leading cause is upper respiratory illnesses. And half of all working Americans are gonna be off work or have some issues with their back at some point or another. Uh, majority of this back pain is mechanical. It's muscles, it's ligaments, it's some bulging discs that resolve, fortunately, spontaneously or with uh, what we consider conservative treatment forms. Uh, but those patients that tend to have longer lasting back pain that don't respond to conservative treatment, those patients that end up having to go to surgery, those patients that end up missing work, uh, when you look at the numbers of missed days, you look at the cost of surgeries, it's about a $50 billion enterprise in the United States. It's a tremendous, tremendous cost. So anything we can do to prevent it is uh, obviously very helpful. Uh, this is a slide that when I look at it, it kind of makes us all feel like we shouldn't get any older. Uh, as you can see, these curves, whoop, I'm sorry. These curves identify with increasing age, the increasing incidence of back pain. 
So once we start getting to our 50s, 60s, and 70s, the incident of back pain uh, across the United States, across Europe, significantly increases. So, and, and the other thing I'll, I'll also emphasize, those people that carry significant weight, uh, that shifts this curve way to the left. So they start having back problems at a much earlier age than the normal population. And, and the curves are pretty similar, both in women and in males. So uh, the causes of back pain uh, are mainly degenerative in nature. We do see some trauma patients, but uh, for the most part, I'm going to talk about the degenerative causes of back pain. Uh, disc disease, uh, we have bulging, degenerative, and herniated disc. And it's all on a, a scale. As time goes on, the discs start to degenerate. Sometimes we'll see some bulging changes. And sometimes the soft part of the disc, the nucleus, will actually fragment out and become herniated. Other very common things that we see is something called spinal stenosis. And spinal stenosis is a disease where the joints become arthritic. They hypertrophy or get bigger. The ligaments around the joints become thick, and it narrows the opening that the nerves pass through. And when it does that, sometimes people will have back pain. In severe cases, they'll start to have pain that travels down their legs and making it very difficult for them to walk. Um, typically, I can go out to Walmart and I can see people lean over the shopping cart and you can almost tell that they have spinal stenosis or trying to relieve their back pain. They tend to walk in a stooped fashion. Another thing that we often see is something called spondylolisthesis. And again, with the aging process, the ligaments get weaker, the joints get weaker, and the spine starts to become unstable. And we'll get a slip. Sometimes the vertebrae can slip on one or the other. And when it slips, it can also irritate the nerves. Another issue that we see are, are fractures. A very common thing would be a compression fracture. Someone has osteoporosis or weak bones. Uh, they can take a seemingly minor fall and, and the bones can crack. And sometimes we have to treat those. Uh, and then we also have typical sprain strains from overlifting. And fortunately, these usually resolve uh, with conservative treatment. Other causes of back pain, uh, as we mentioned, the osteoarthritis, that affects the joints on the side of the spine. Um, that can lead to stiffness. And again, in severe cases, if the nerves are irritated, it can uh, contribute to the spinal stenosis. You'll see something called osteomyelitis, and that's actually an infection that develops in the back. Uh, people can have an infection in the disc space. They can get abscess in the spine. And usually this happens in people that uh, are immune compromised, somebody who may be on dialysis, somebody who uh, may have cancer and has gone through chemotherapy. Their immune system doesn't work very well and they can be prone to developing infections. And so we always have to keep an eye out on whether they've got an abscess or whether they've got some type of an infection to treat. Fibromyalgia is a sort of a, uh, a strange pain pathology. I'm, I'm not sure there's a real specific etiology uh, and I'm not sure there's a very good treatment for fibromyalgia. People tend to have achiness and pain in the muscles, pain in the joints. Uh, usually when I see somebody with fibromyalgia, it's not just their back, it's their hips, it's their shoulders, it's, it's all uh, different parts of their body that seem to have pain. Uh, we've even seen uh, patients with uh, uh, gynecolo gynecological issues, uh, endometriosis. I, I actually uh, saw a patient who had a, a uterine tumor that had gone on and she had continued back pain and we couldn't really find a cause. And then we got a CAT scan and she had this big uterine tumor. Kidney stones can also cause back pain. And in fact, that's a, a lot of reason People sometimes show up in the emergency room uh, 
thinking they have had strained their back or something, but then they end up being diagnosed with a kidney stone. They may have blood in their urine or something of that nature. And then uh, cancers. We always uh, worry about somebody who carries a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, could there be some type of a metastasis that affects the spine? Uh, so we have to be wary of that. And that's uh, part of the imaging studies to kind of help us make that diagnosis. Uh, this is a slide that gives you an example uh, of what happens to the spine as, as we age. Uh, this is the nice teenager spine. This is the middle-aged spine, and this is what happens as we get into our 60s and 70s. So a lot of the emphasis in trying to treat this is to try to strengthen these support muscles, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But exercise to strengthen the back, strengthen the core, to try to stave off this kind of curvature and stress that happens in the spine. And every time I look at this picture, I try to suck it in real quick and, and stand up real tall. But, but you can see what a weak core does to the spine. It, it, it almost pulls it down. So the emphasis on trying to strengthen your core, if you've ever been to physical therapy or chiropractor, you know, they're always trying to emphasize some of these exercises that are very important for us. This slide shows the process that goes on with the disc. Again, as we're young and healthy, the disc is full of cushion. There's a, a nucleus pulposus on the inside, and that's held in place by an annulus. And just like some of the ligaments that get weak as time goes on, the annulus that circles the disc gets weak and it starts to degenerate. And when it degenerates, you get little micro tears that happen. When those tears happen, that makes the disc susceptible to bulging. Now, even sometimes a bulging disc can be a major problem if it bulges underneath the nerve and there's not enough room for the nerve to get through. But then as it progresses, that soft part of the disc will rupture out the back of the disc and it breaks through that annulus and that's a, a herniated or a free fragment. It's a piece of disc that's broken away and is compressing uh, the nerve roots. As time goes on, the aging spine, we lose all this cushion. One of the reasons we get shorter as we get older is our discs get thinner and they tend to collapse down. And when that happens, sometimes even that collapsed disc can cause the nerves to get irritated by the joints in the back. Oftentimes you'll go to the doctor and you know, you know your back's hurting, but the doctors are always asking you, do you have pain in your butt? Do you have pain that goes down your leg? Do you have numbness? And we're actually trying to determine whether or not you've got a pinched nerve in your back. Your main emphasis may be on the back, but particularly to the surgeons, the neurosurgeons, the chiropractors, the physical therapists, we want to make sure you don't have any nerve damage. And these nerves in the lower part of your back all branch out. They form a big cable that you've all heard of called the sciatic nerve. And that sciatic nerve runs underneath your butt muscle. And then as it goes down your leg, it branches off to various muscles in your leg. So when we're checking your reflexes, when we're checking your strength in your leg, we're trying to determine whether or not you've got any significant compression of those nerve roots. The, uh, and you've, you've all had your grandmother tell her that her sciatic is acting up. And it's really her back that's acting up, but she's always talking about her sciatica. So the ways that we look at back pain, uh, there's three main tests for us. Uh, an x-ray, a CAT scan, and an MRI scan. Both of us give it, both, all three of them give us information, but it's, it's different kinds of information. Sometimes we have to have all three, sometimes we can get by with an MRI, but, uh, but they all play a very important role for us. An x-ray, what I'm mainly looking at when I look at an x-ray, first of all, I wanna make sure there's no destructive lesions in the bone. I make sure I can see all the bones, the pedicles, the transverse process. I want to make sure they're all lined up. When I look at this x-ray, I want to look at the disc height. 
I want to see these little areas in the back are called the foramen. And that's where the nerves actually come through that go down your leg uh, to form that sciatic nerve. So I want to make sure that the foramen are fairly open. And I want to make sure there's no slip. I'll show you a little bit later what a spondylolisthesis looks like. So the CAT scan, the CAT scan also gives us some information on the bone. It also gives us a relative idea what the canal looks like. So we can get an idea whether or not there's enough room for the nerves to sit in there. Um, the CAT scan is also important. We can look for bony destruction in a case of somebody having metastatic disease. But like this CAT scan, this guy's got a lesion in his kidney over here. So, uh, and that's incidentally picked up. So uh, CAT scan can also give us some important information. And this is a, a, another cut on a CAT scan. Again, we're looking to make sure everything's lined up real well, making sure the canal's got plenty of room. Um, and then the MRI scan. The, actually, the MRI probably gives us the most information. Uh, we can look at the MRI. We can get an idea what the discs look like. If you'll notice in this scan, these discs are pretty white, which uh, on the MRI, the MRI actually looks, it's a, it's a magnet, and it breaks parts of the body, water, into different components. So water uh, is good for the disc. It means there's a lot of cushion in there. It's a nice, healthy disc. If you look at this bottom disc, you can notice that it's a little darker than the others. So it started to have a little bit of deterioration down here. Not that it's bad. I mean, it's not ruptured. It's not particularly bulging. But it just gives us a little bit of an idea what those changes look like. If you look at the canal, I can see the nerves as they come down through the canal. And that's what we're looking at. I want to make sure there's not a big disc rupture pinching those nerves. I want to make sure they all slide down through here and it gives, make sure there's plenty of room in that area. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a few other. These are abnormal MRI scans. Uh, starting with this one in the bottom, this is sort of what a metastatic cancer would look like. You can see the big tumor. It's kind of eroded into the bone. And obviously this patient's got lots of pain. And so this is something we either decide that uh, we need to give him radiation, chemo, uh, whether he needs some kind of big decompression and, and reconstruction here. Uh, this is actually a benign tumor called an ependymoma, and it, it looks nasty on MRI scan, but you can notice if you look real close, the edges are nice and round. It doesn't look as angry and as destructive as this tumor. Sometimes we'll see people come in with back pain or sciatic type pain and lo and behold we get an MRI and they've got a, a benign tumor inside their spinal canal. And so this is something that once you take it out you, you can cure them. They don't have to have any radiation, they don't have to have any chemotherapy, just a bunch of follow-up MRI scans after we're done. Um, and then this is the typical thing that we would see most of the time in the office. Here's somebody with degenerative disc at several levels but if you notice, that soft, cushy portion of the disc is ruptured out here. And so there's a big chunk of disc that's ruptured out. And so this patient's probably having really bad leg pain. So how do we treat these things? Um, usually, the first thing, if somebody's got back pain, we tell them to take anti-inflammatories. We tell them to use heat or ice. Stretching. In the old days when I was training, they made us put people in bed for a week. And, you know, finally they, we figured out that that's probably not very good for a patient. So, so stretching, limited activity, try to stay mobile and, and avoid bed rest. Most of the cases of back pain within 48, 72 hours will start kicking in. And if it's not anything serious, they're going to start getting better. Uh, if they don't get better, then we start thinking about uh, getting some imaging and other forms of treatment. Other forms of concerted treatment that we all use, physical therapy, chiro excuse me, chiropractic care. Uh, sometimes we use trigger point injections or facet injections to try to block those areas of the spine that we think are causing pain. 
uh, and epidural injections, very similar to the epidurals that uh, a pregnant mother receives. Uh, we try to get a dose of steroid in along the nerve root to see if we can quiet down the sciatica. Doesn't work quite as well just as back pain. We have to really have a good target to try to hit to try to improve those symptoms. And then we also have patients that regardless of what form of conservative treatment and even some people that have had surgery fail to improve. So chronic back pain becomes somewhat of a different issue. So we try other alternatives such as acupuncture. Uh, there are uh, pain stimulators that are actually implanted into the spine that uh, send a uh, uh, electric, a small electric current to the pain sensors in the back of the spinal cord. And at times that's helpful trying to keep people off of narcotics, trying to keep them functioning. Uh, oftentimes people have chronic back pain or depressed and it's a significant issue that uh, needs to be dealt with with cognitive behavioral therapy to try to improve their overall prognosis. And there's a big emphasis now trying to get away with the use of narcotics. So we use a lot of anti-inflammatories. Uh, and if we do use narcotics, it's only a, a short trial, 10 days, two weeks. And then we try to uh, move on and do something different. So uh, usually our boards, uh, insurance companies, all like to make sure that we've exhausted conservative treatment before we start thinking about any kind of an operation. Uh, once you come to the office, uh, it's not that we're trying to delay the surgery, but the insurance companies, and, and really for good reason, want to make sure that we've tried to exhaust everything before we, we do an operation. So usually the recommendations is four to six weeks of conservative treatment, non-steroidals, physical therapy, chiropractic, injections, unless somebody has a neurological deficit. If you're starting to get numbness or weakness in your legs, you start to have bowel or bladder dysfunction, those are things that make us move a little quicker and try to get something more definitive done to try to uh, get the pressure off of those nerves. Uh, and, and always think of surgery as the treatment of last resort. And I really shouldn't say it as a surgeon, but that's, it, it is. It's something that we really, we, we want to try to make sure you've exhausted everything before we do anything. So, and, and part of the reason is that surgeries have risk. Anytime uh, the smallest microsurgery I can do versus the biggest surgery I can do, they all have the same risk. We worry about bleeding, infection, anesthetic complications. Uh, injury to the nerve with worsening numbness, weakness, bowel or bladder dysfunction, spinal fluid leak. Statistically, the chance of hurting the nerve is probably less than 1%. It's a very small, uh, uh, small risk, but it, it's still there and it shouldn't be uh, neglected. Uh, a spinal fluid leak happens because uh, there's a sac that goes over the nerves that contains spinal fluid in it. And in about one out of 100 back surgeries, while we're retracting the nerve roots or getting the nerve out of the way, you can get a little tear in that covering. And it's usually not a big deal. It's something we fix, we suture it, we pack glue on it, and we put a patient to bed rest for a couple of days. Otherwise, if they get a spinal headache, they'll be miserable for a few days and they won't be very happy with us. So, Spinal fluid leak is actually much more common in people that have to have repeat surgeries because there's a lot of scar tissue and trying to separate that scar tissue away from the disc or away from the nerves uh, makes it uh, a little bit more uh, of a risk to that procedure. And then hardware failure. Anytime we put in an implant and as expensive as those implants are and they're made out of the finest titanium uh, we've all had a screw that'll break. We've all had a, an implant that'll try to back out. And, and again, that's a very, very small risk as, as spine surgery goes. Again, it's less than one or two percent, but nonetheless, it's something that happens. And it's one of the reasons as we're following people post-op, we get a 
set of x-rays a couple weeks, we get a set of x-rays a month, we get another set maybe three or four months, and even uh, depending on the procedure, sometimes we're still getting x-rays a year or so down the road to check on those things. And even despite our very best efforts, there's always going to be some people that just don't seem to quite get better. Uh, usually we do a pretty good job freeing up the nerves, but people still have the arthritis in their back. They still have some back pain. Uh, uh, and, and hopefully that is something that I always encourage them to give time, let that try to improve. That's why post-op exercise is, is really important for them. So some of the things that we do from a surgical standpoint. Uh, when I was hanging out with those surgeons back in medical school, actually one of the guys at the hospital wouldn't buy him a microscope. So he went out and bought his own microscope and had it delivered in a truck to the hospital. And we thought that was the neatest thing. So I, I really enjoyed learning under the microscope. So a lot of the things that I like to do or microscopic surgeries. Uh, this is an example of a, a discectomy, and we take that out through a little tiny tube. Uh, we use a, a microscope to look down, and we have small bayoneted instruments that allow us to get down in there and get underneath the nerve roots and free up the nerves. Uh, this is practical only when people have this disease at, at one level. Obviously, if somebody's got a bad disc, it, three or four levels, you don't want to make three or four little tiny holes to, to try to get to those discs. So usually this is for somebody who has a ruptured disc at one level. And this is uh, an example, and I know the picture's kind of fuzzy, but you can usually do this through a little incision. This is an example of the tube that we use. And as I'm looking down through the microscope, and I know it all looks red in there, but trust me, there's a nerve root right here and a piece of disc right here. And once we get that cleaned out, you can see how the nerve and everything is a lot freer and you can see the little gap that's there once we clean that disc out of the way. That's probably the most common back surgery that we do. Uh, this is a schematic representation and these are all the bones of the spine. And these are the nerves as they branch off but you can see we've drilled a little tiny opening in the bone. And usually I tell people that opening is about the size of a dime. And, and once we get underneath there, we will find the disc material that has been uh, shown to us on the MRI scans. And th this is another example. Uh, and you can see here's that herniated disc. This is the bottom of that thecal sac. And here's the nerve root coming out. And you can see how the disc, when it ruptures, unfortunately, a lot of times it'll rupture posteriorly and it'll bang into those nerve roots. And this is giving you another view of what that little opening that we drill in the bone is. And we come down and we resect. Now, usually doing a, a microdiscectomy, we want to try to preserve some cushion in the disc. So we don't want to take out 100% of the disc. We do that if we're going to do a fusion, we want to try to take out as much disc as we can because we want to get good bone on bone if we're trying to do a fusion. But if we're trying to preserve a disc doing a microdiscectomy, we'll just take out what parts we think are the loose parts in there. This is an example of a compression fracture. Uh, sometimes someone with osteoporosis, the bones are weaker and this can cause a, a fair amount of back pain. Uh, compression fractures, just like all other fractures, they, they will heal. Uh, it may take 6, 8, 10, 12 weeks for it to heal. But during that process, if somebody has a hard time controlling that pain and it's something that it limits their mobility, they can't get around, the pain's not something they can control with medications or something they can control with a brace, there's a procedure called a kyphoplasty that we'll sometimes do. And a kyphoplasty involves putting them to sleep, uh, taking them uh, to the uh, surgery department, and then we introduce a, a cannulated needle through the bone into that vertebral body. And once in the vertebral body, uh, we inflate a little balloon. And the little balloon, because this bone is so soft, 
will make a pocket. And uh, the bone, as that blue inflates, kind of forms a little pocket that then we later will put some cement in. And this is sort of what the cement looks like afterwards. We withdraw the balloon, then put another uh, cannula inside that needle, and this cement hardens in about five minutes. So it, it hardens very quick. Uh, so we leave them on the table. We get a series of x-rays to make sure that everything looks like it's in good position uh, before we wake them up. And it's usually an outpatient procedure. People tend to go home, you know, the same day it's done. And unless they have a type of a compression fracture where the posterior elements of the bone are fractured, then sometimes we have to do it in an open fashion. And if we do that, then we have to keep them at least a day or two. And so now I'll talk uh, again about spinal stenosis. I've mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, mainly the ligaments in the joint uh, deteriorate, they hypertrophy, and you can see this gnarly looking joint and, and what it's doing, it's compressing the nerves underneath. So if they failed physical therapy, if injections haven't helped, and there's enough stenosis, one of the treatments is to drill out this joint and try to free up that nerve. Now, this is a cross section, again, showing a normal looking canal. And then here's the spinal stenosis. You can see how the ligaments are getting thick, the joints are getting thick. And this person even has a little bit of a degenerative bulging disc. So the surgical treatment for those for years has, has been a laminectomy. And if somebody's got bad disease on both sides or bad disease on multiple levels, the, the way that we do that is to just basically unroof the spine to make sure the nerves are all free and make sure the thecal sac's well decompressed. The disadvantage of doing that is it sometimes destabilizes the spine. And so, although it, it may be something that needs to be done, it's important for us to get x-rays where we're actually bending the patients back and forth to make sure their ligaments are strong and the spine is strong enough to withstand a laminectomy. Uh, and again, this gives you an idea how much bone is removed, this big segment of bone. And, and this is a, a nice drawing, but most time you have to even get a lot more of these joints out of the way to make sure the nerves are real decompressed. And this is a, a look from the back. You can see here's the canal, the nerves coming down. And so there's a nice decompression, nice laminectomy there. And another way we can treat it, again, if it's at a, a single level or sometimes at two levels, uh, lady I did today was two levels, but in order to try to preserve, sorry about that, other to try to preserve some of the spine and some of the muscles, we again can use that same tube and go down into the spine and try to cut a wedge out from underneath and, and with a microscope. And in doing that, we can get the same decompression a lot of times that people get with a laminectomy. But by doing that, we preserve the muscles, we preserve the spinous process. And so this patient uh, statistically is not someone that's gonna need to have a big fusion down the road. So uh, this is one of the things that we, we try to do uh, as often as we can. Uh, so when we talk about a fusion, most of the time when we're thinking about a fusion, we're doing that because somebody's got an unstable spine. Uh, usually the vertebrae are nicely lined up on top of each other. Uh, there's something called a grade one where there's a slight slip off the edge. Uh, there's a grade two and grade three. Uh, thank God I've never seen any of these. These would be hard to put back together. But... Uh, with these, what we worry about is, is if we're going to decompress and we're going to take the joint away, they've already got a little bit of a slip. And if I take the joints away, I'm going to make that slip a little bit bigger. And it may take six months, it may take a year, it may take five years, but eventually it's going to get weaker and weaker. So sometimes when we have a slip, we'll err on the safe side and try to do one operation. And that's where we try to put the screws in and, and do a fusion. Once the decompression is complete, we'll put screws and rods on each side to hold everything together. 
And this is an example of somebody who's got a grade one slip. This is at the very bottom at L5S1. And the thing I want you to notice, you can see how big this opening is here. That's the foramen that the nerves come through at this level. But at this level, it's, you can see it's kind of oblong and it's narrowed down. One thing you can't see is there's also probably a bulging disc here. So between all that, that's where the nerve gets pinched. And the job is to fix that is to drill all this bone off back here. But if we do that, we're worried that this vertebrae is going to end up being way up here at some point in the future. And so that's why we do the stabilization. And here's another example, you know, the, where the facet joint is compressing the nerve. And this is uh, one type of fusion, and it can sometimes be a big operation if there's multiple levels. We sometimes have to put screws and rods at multiple levels. Uh, and, you know, there's a fair amount of blood loss. Uh, these patients can be in the hospital for quite a while sometimes as they try to recover from that. Now, for the last year, Archbold's uh, brought a system in that um, allows us to map out the spine without making a big incision and having everything opened up. So this map is laid on the patient's back and then we have a scanner that comes in and does a 360 around the patient. And while it's doing that 360, it's taking an x-ray continually. And once that x-ray is completed, then on the computer, we actually can make a 3D model of the spine. And by doing that, we can actually pick out our screws, we can tell the depth of the screws, we can tell the angle of the screws. And the big advantage is that in certain cases, it allows us to do, you saw the big fusion, allows us to do the fusion with two little bitty incisions on both sides of the spine. And these are patients that will stay in the hospital overnight. Again, we don't have to take apart all the muscles, we don't have to take apart all the bones. And so it, it provides the patients a big advantage. And uh, for the surgeons, it gives us a lot more accuracy with even placing the screws. So this is an example of uh, some of the computer work that's done. This is the computer reconstructing a 3D model of the spine. These are an example of the screws. Now, this screw holder actually has a little module on top of it that has fiducials. And so wherever I hold that screw, the computer actually picks it up and it'll tell me to say, no, stupid, you've got to angle it a little differently. And so it actually tells us where we need to hold that in space to kind of uh, keep a good position so we can get the screws in the right spot. And this is, again, an example of the software. And you can see how these are uh, imaginary screws that the computer's drawn for us, telling us where, where we need to help get them into the spine. And this is an example of, of the screws being placed um, in, in a fusion um, with a smaller incision. One of the other things that we also do, particularly while we're putting the screws in, is we don't want to injure a nerve, so we hook a patient up after they've gone to sleep, and we'll have a monitor that'll actually monitor all the muscles that the nerves are innervated to. And so if I'm putting a screw in that's too close to a nerve, the tech over here will send uh, a message to the neurologist that's actually reading this, and they'll let me know. And by doing that, then I can cha actually change the position of the, the screw right there in the operating room. I don't have to get an x-ray after surgery. I don't have to wait two or three weeks to change it. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice advantage. It makes us all a lot comfortable, particularly if we're trying to put them in through these little tiny holes where we don't have good visualization. This is another type of a fusion device. Uh, sometimes w this is actually approved without the hardware. This is actually a screw cage that we can put in and we pack it with bone. Uh, it's very similar to after we've done a discectomy and somebody that's pretty healthy and has 
good intact ligaments, ligaments we can slide that in its place and this will actually fuse and bone will actually grow all around this as time goes on. And uh, this, is a, this is a device, people that have osteoporosis and soft bones, sometimes we can't use the screws because we're afraid they'll, uh, just like putting a screw in a drywall, sometimes it'll get loose. And this is a clamp that, that's made actually just to fit over the back of the spine. And it's not as stable as the pedicle screws, but nonetheless, if somebody that's not gonna be out baling hay and doing a lot of heavy lifting, this will hold up actually pretty well for us. So and these are some of my favorite things. I hope I'm not boring you too much, but this is actually a, a cervical disc that was made by a company in France. And uh, I, um, I went to the uh, Texas Back Institute about eight or 10 years ago when this was first coming out and a bunch of us surgeons were learning how to put these in. And uh, it, it actually became FDA approved very shortly thereafter. And um, these allow us, instead of, it, these are made for the cervical spine. Instead of the old days taking a chunk of bone out of your hip and then putting a plate and screws, this device allows us to put a spacer in that still moves. And so you don't lose any mobility with this spacer. The other nice thing that it does, a lot of patients who have plates and screws, as the years go on, they'll develop what we call adjacent segment disease, where one of the other levels are starting to stress out and they'll rupture a disc at another level. The five-year studies comparing these discs, there's much less risk of them developing disease at another level. So uh, this is something I've put in, I think about seven or eight of them since I've been here in, in, in Thomasville. And this is what it looks like when it slides in. These, attach, these little teeth attach to the vertebrae, but this is all plastic and it pivots, it rotates, it extends, it flexes to the side. And uh, again, when we put these in, you know, you don't have a great big plate and a whole bunch of screws in front. Uh, they fit right into the disc space. And knock on wood, e even the ones back in Illinois, I haven't gotten any bad calls. I've ever had to take any of them out. So, uh, uh, so uh, that, was the, that was the fun thing that, the, the hard thing is that there's no magic bullets for back pain. Uh, you have to stay active, you have to exercise, you have to try to maintain a healthy body weight, You're not supposed to smoke. Uh, and, and I tease my patients when they come in the office, I always ask them if they're doing their push-ups and their sit-ups. And, you know, they look at me, a big majority of them are in their 70s and 80s, and no, they're not doing their push-ups and sit-ups. But I try to encourage them to walk. You know, if you're walking three or four days a week, you're going to actually tone your core. Uh, if you've got the time to do a yoga class, Pilates, uh, some people back in Illinois would do something called silver sneakers. I don't know if they have that here, but it's a great exercise class for everybody. Uh, swimming at the Y, anything you can do to keep moving, to try to keep yourself in, in, in reasonable shape uh, will help prevent some of the major back problems. So. And I think that's it. Oh, and it's, it's actually a, a pleasure to be out of a big concrete cubicle and have an office. I actually have a fireplace in my office. That's pretty amazing, this big old house. So, so. any questions at all? Or Laser spine surgery? Uh, it's, they do the similar operation to a small tube. And uh, I don't know how to answer that question. They have a phenomenal marketing campaign. I wish I had their marketing dollars. Uh, uh, they are, um, because of that approach, the general neurosurgery public uh, kind of put them in the back corner uh, because the way they advertise and things. But I, I'm sure they have good spine surgeons and... Uh, uh, but uh, we just haven't gotten involved with that. And I usually don't tell people don't go look on the internet, but uh, there's a ton of back exercises uh, on the internet. 
Um, it, a real common back exercise has been around for a long time as an Australian group. They're called the McKinsey back exercises. And uh, they, they're probably the, uh, the ones that most of the therapists, I, I think, tend to lean toward. I usually am nervous when people look on the internet but actually, on the internet, there's a lot of good back exercises. Uh, a real common, if you see the name McKinsey back exercises, they were developed in Australia, but it's a, it's a real standard core exercise program that people use. Uh, a lot of physical therapy people use them. It's mainly core strengthening exercises, flexibility in your hip flexors, flexibility in your hamstrings. So. Sometimes, I'll, you know, I, I always have somebody tells me that uh, heat doesn't work very well. So, so alternate back and forth to see which one seems to provide you the, the best relief. So typically the thinking is if you just do it to put ice on it uh -huh. and not the heat. But uh -huh. I, I have some people that kind of go back and forth. So one of the questions I had was about a TENS unit. And uh, I, I mentioned to her that Medicare controls a lot of what we do now. And there's a couple of different studies that came out and saying 10 units were 50-50 and Medicare decides they're not going to take care of them. And so I told her that if a 10 unit works for her, she should use it. And uh, uh, if the 10 unit keeps her out of a surgeon's office, that, that's perfectly fine. It's non-invasive and it's not going not to hurt her. So, And then somebody asked about... Uh, taking something besides an NSAID. If they can't take naproxen, Aleve, uh, Tylenol works. Uh, Tylenol doesn't have as much of the anti-inflammatory as, as, as an NSAID, but uh, it's, it's a lot safer on your kidneys. And so Tylenol, extra strength Tylenol is fine. If you've got a job where you can be on your feet and be active, I, I think that's awesome. Uh, sitting, you know, it really makes our cores weak. And, you know, so many of us have office jobs. It's, uh, it's you know, part of the process. And uh, as active as we can be, uh, you know, the, I, I always see these commercials, these crazy Veridesk things, these people standing. So uh, it's probably a good idea. Probably a cage similar to the one that I was uh, showing you there. Uh, I don't know of any real springs, but you, if, if that disc is all collapsed down and it's pinching a nerve, yeah. you, you, know, you probably need to get something in there to jack it open so you got more room for the nerves on that side. Uh, but that's, it's probably very similar. You know, I showed you one that, that we use a lot. Right. You know, the spine industry, there are probably 50 or even more implants that you can put in. Back braces are kind of controversial. If you're going to wear it while you're doing some some work and then going to take it off after a while, that's fine. If you wear that back brace 24-7, it's actually going to make your muscles weak because it's not going to help support you. So if you got some yard work to do and you want to flip it on to kind of protect yourself, that's a perfect way to use it. So. Now, if you've had a fusion done and we tell you to stay in your brace while you're up and about for X amount of months, uh, that's a different story because we're wanting the bone to heal real good. So That's one of those relative questions. So it depends on how much it bothers you. You, you know, I, I oftentimes will have people see me in the office and I, you know, tell them, well, just put up with it as long as you can. And if it gets to where... You can't get around, you're not able to enjoy the things you like to do, call me and get back in, come in and see me. I don't want anybody jumping off a roof or out of a window because their back pain is so miserable. But, but, you know, we all have that pain where we get up in the morning, it aches, it's sore, but, you know, you're, you're still out doing your normal everyday activities. That's not somebody I'd probably nudge to have an operation done. There are some newer implants as well. Uh, there's something called a Nevro. It's a, it's a new implant. It's just been out a couple of years or so. And it actually has provided a, a lot more relief than the older implants. Uh, the, the worst thing with the old implants is sometimes you'll get some scar tissue that develops around them, and that can indirectly start to pinch a nerve. And it can kind of be tough getting them out of there. 
So I'd been in town probably about two or three months and a guy was having back pain and, and you know, we looked at his MRI scan, didn't see too much on it. And finally I did a CAT scan of his abdomen. He had a kidney tumor. So, uh, you know, if you, if you have back pain and, and you, it's not getting better, you know, we just need to look further. So when, whenever somebody tells me that, it always makes me wonder about that bottom vertebrae. If you were the pelvis, uh, at, which we consider the S1 vertebrae and the L5 vertebrae, it always makes me wonder that that slid. So where the pelvis and the bottom of the spine attach, uh, that's, that's what I think when somebody tells me that. So you may have that, that slip or the big word we call spondylolisthesis, right, right. So strengthen your core.